I started working with the Abenaki, the ancestral people of what we now call northern New England and southern Quebec, in 2017. It's a strange but depressingly common mistake. I worked to support indigenous people all around the world before it occurred to me to support the indigenous people who are my neighbors. I was planning an exhibition of carvings for International Mother Language Day, each of which would read Mother Tongue in a different minority script or language. I included a carving that in Abnaki was said as language of the ancestors who went before. It was my first lesson in cultural rather than literal translation, and it opened several doors in the sense that I met some Abenaki citizens, but also in the sense that I started to see and understand things from a cultural and linguistic perspective that was very different from my own. During the exhibition, when I asked visitors about the Abnaki, almost everyone had either never heard of them or assumed they had died out. Over the next two years, I did a number of other carvings in Abenaki, some for display in tribal centers, one for the Vermont State House, And in one of these encounters, I was told that one reason why people knew so little about the Abenaki was because they were not taught about them in school. And sure enough, even though Vermont state standards strongly encouraged learning about diverse cultures, there were simply no classroom materials available. So the Abenaki remained hidden and largely unknown to Vermont children. In late 2018, I applied for a grant from the Champlain Valley National Heritage Partnership to work with Brenda Gagné, now chief of the Missisquoi Abenaki, on an illustrated Abenaki dictionary for schools. Brenda runs an after-school program in Swanton, Vermont, called the Abenaki Circle of Courage to teach both native and non-native children about the Abnaki people, their history, art, traditions, and language. I mistakenly thought I knew exactly what the project would involve. I had already supervised the creation of a six-language children's dictionary for indigenous languages of the Chittagong Hill Tracks of Bangladesh, but this project would turn out to be much more complex and illuminating in ways I never expected. At first, I thought of the dictionary the same way I would think of a children's learning dictionary in English. Here's a picture of something you know, and here's the word, so now you can learn to read the word. Very quickly, though, it became clear that any dictionary is more than that, and this dictionary in particular would be much more than that. For many indigenous communities all over the world, the act of compiling a dictionary is a vital part of language preservation and revival simply because as the mother tongue uses age and die and the next generations learn perhaps only bits and pieces of the language, the words are lost. Even more than that, the Abnaki dictionary would give a glimpse of a language that works in an entirely different way to English. English, one Abenaki citizen explained to me, is a language based on nouns and therefore on things. Abenaki is based on verbs and connections. Even the way words are constructed is based on gathering together connected elements. As one Abenaki citizen told me, I never understood what it means to be Abenaki until I started to learn the language. More subtly, the dictionary would give the Abenaki a chance to learn or relearn their own language, and in the process, rediscover themselves and their heritage. Like many native peoples, the Abenaki were encouraged to deny or conceal their identity, but in their case, this was enforced in an especially direct and brutal way. The eugenics movement, which had firm rooting in Vermont, preached elimination of crime and disease by improving the gene pool. 
The first step was to identify families who exhibited signs of multi-generational criminality or feeble-mindedness. The second was to carry out enforced sterilization. Many Abenaki women, possibly hundreds, are thought to have suffered in this way. Not surprisingly, the Abenaki essentially went into hiding. Taking great care not to speak their language, especially in public, was just one precaution. One tribal chief told me in 2017 that his own grandmother denied to that day that she was Abenaki. A dictionary, then, is a commitment of respect, a recognition that a language community exists, is vital, and deserves attention or even study. This issue turned up even more clearly when the kids in the Circle of Courage were called on to act as editors and to make a vital choice, which 100 words should be included. From the get-go, Brenda told me, the kids insisted the dictionary should include their language, that is, the language of young teenagers living in Vermont in the early 21st century. Perhaps without realizing or articulating it, they put their finger on a major issue facing Native peoples in America today, especially the way Native peoples are depicted in education. One study found that more than 80% of all references to Native Americans in school textbooks were pre-contact with Europeans. In other words, the textbooks implied that either the native people of the continent had died out or had been totally assimilated into white society or simply weren't worth mentioning. This led to a paradox familiar to many indigenous people worldwide and certainly to Native Americans. Should they be portrayed in their traditional garb, doing their traditional activities, which would establish their unique identities and traditions, but might imply that they were figures from the past? Or should they be portrayed as present-day Americans, alive and well, but without some of the remarkable qualities of their heritage, or something in between? This conundrum was solved by our illustrator, Kelsey Brett, herself a young woman of Abenaki heritage. An illustrated dictionary, she demonstrated, can be a series of individual pictures, but it can also be a panorama, a mini documentary showing people in their social context, in their relationship with the natural world. Her pages showed a cultural awareness and knowledge of birds, animals, landscapes, and the heavens, that therefore implied a connected worldview, a view that strikes me, speaking strictly as an outsider, as very Abenaki. But the full potential of the dictionary didn't become clear to me until we worked on the front cover. The title of the book, Brenda decided, would be Ndakina, meaning the homelands or our homelands. The title itself then shifted the focus and identity of the book from a collection of words to a depiction of both a people and a place and the relationship between the two. And to the Abenaki with their profound connection with the land, it's impossible to separate the homeland from their creation story. So the cover became an amazing amalgam of an aerial view of the Champlain Valley and Lake Champlain and a depiction of the creator spirit forming the lake, the mountains, the islands, everything. The dictionary then had become something very different from an atomized European dictionary, a catalog of words unrelated to each other except by alphabetical order. It became an opening door an invitation to see the world in a new and connected way. It became Ndakina, the homelands.